Hi everyone, Evelina from Arcadia here. Today we're speaking with Wang Ling, founder and CEO of Caregiver Asia, an online services marketplace connecting caregivers and healthcare professionals with care seekers. Based out of Singapore with over 2,000 active healthcare professionals listed and a growing presence in Malaysia and the United States, Caregiver Asia is changing the way we think about how healthcare services can be delivered. Hi Wang Ling, thank you for joining us. Hi. Since you are in the healthcare industry and you obviously are on you know, the ground, seeing everything and experiencing everything. Um, where do you see innovation in the healthcare industry heading? What, what do you see for its future? And how do you, see, uh, where do you see Caregiver Asia fitting into all of that? I think a lot of people actually want to make decisions for themselves, you know? And I mean, even for myself, you know, um, even though my, my father was a doctor, you know, I actually found myself um, reading up about, you know, symptoms, you know, conditions that I had. It could be like, you know, why do I have a sore throat? Or like, why, why are my eyes like, you know, puffy? And I would go on to the web, you know, to, to look for, you know, information about my symptoms and, you know, kind of like have an idea, you know, or a hypothesis of what I have before I go and see, you know, a doctor. And so I can have a more, I would say, um, inclusive type of discussion with him. You know, and I think what happens, right, this will be so um, going forward, right, in um, the decision for healthcare. I actually do see, right, that less people, or, I mean, that there's actually more people who are going towards a model, right, where they want to be informed, you know, um, about the type of options that they can actually be looking at, whether or not it is in service delivery, whether it's in the type of caregivers, or whether or not it's in a diagnosis, you know, um, of their of their problems. They have um, all the information that they need in order, right, to um, uh, make the right choice, you know, or the best choice, right, for caregivers that they can get. So, like for instance, I had mentioned you know, that um, within the the service postings and all that, right, you'll be able to get um, a very detailed summary, you know, of what um, caregivers are actually providing um, in terms of, of, of their services. Um, but also at the same time, um, there are um, open reviews. So the review system is a star rating system um, as well as a free text um, system um, of uh, caregivers who have... Um, Actually, uh, of, of care seekers, right, who've actually engaged certain caregivers. So um, I think all these, right, all add, you know, to helping someone making an informed, you know, and non-scary decision, right, on the caregiver. By far, the vast majority of our care seekers actually do repeat their services, um, about 70% of them. And yes, well, I say, right, um, uh, there are pockets of them who actually book the same service over and over again. I'm also pre pretty happy to say, right, that um, most of them actually book um, a variety of services. So for instance, you know, we have nursing, medical care, therapy, you know, and we also have wellness. So I, I do see that there is a very good uh, percentage of first time users of platform booking, I would say easy and, and relatively risk free you know, type of services such as yoga for the elderly or Zumba Go, you know, and after that, right, they might move on, right, to something, right, um, that is a little bit of their comfort zones, but, you know, um, but because they already know us from the first instance of uh, providing really good care, you know, we actually see them um, booking nursing care or even like therapeutic or pain management type of care to the platform. And, and I do think, right, um, that this will affect many um, parts of the healthcare continuum, and I think one main part of it would actually be in patient records. You know, um, I think a lot more people, right, would want to have possession, you know, um, of their um, of their health records. You know, um, and this will lead right into um, how they want to make um, decisions on the kind of care that they receive. Um, I think this would also um, extend right into um, uh, products products for healthcare as well. You know, um, I think there will be a lot more marketplaces out there that um, would complement, you know, um, the service delivery in terms of the type of products that can come with it. Um, and um, also at the same time, right, you know, with um, the 
the rise of like you know AI and all that, I also would think right that there will be a lot more accountability, you know, um, to the end consumer um, on what kinds of um, data you know um, is being collected from them and what kind of um, um, permissions right would actually be needed right um, uh, within within the collection of this kind of data and the usage of it. I mean, I definitely am a huge WebMD fan, um, so <laughs> totally understand that. It's really interesting, specifically for all the listeners or anybody who's creating a services-based platform, um, because that trust is so important. Services isn't just like buying, you know, a dress online or a pair of shorts or you know whatever. Um, when you provide, especially something as intimate and vulnerable as you know, helping care or finding caregivers, it's extremely important. So I think the idea of a call center and high touch and always being available is extremely, extremely important um, in the services marketplace. That's amazing. Um, I know that you, before you mentioned that Caregiver Asia and you've been traveling, um, there's a lot of problems worldwide and globally about you know, how healthcare services are being provided. Um, and I know that you guys are moving into Malaysia and United States as well as other countries. Do you have to, um, how different is it for you guys to, or the services or the platform, do you have to change it a lot for those specific countries? Do you have specific problems that are only to those countries that you then have to address? Are there different pain points? Sure. Um, well, that's a really interesting question because I think by far we try to make um, our business model a very scalable one. You know, so um, we actually, the platform itself, www.caregiverasia.com, um, it's actually a multi-language, multi-country, as well as multi-currency type of platform, you know. Um, and in terms of scalability, we hope that a lot of these best practices that we have in Singapore, um, as well as, you know, um, the, the type of development that we have done in tech itself would be able, right, um, to help us, you know, um, launch into new markets, right, um, in a slightly easier way. However, having said this, because, you know, um, I think each country has its own, you know, particular type of, you know, uh, I would say differences, whether or not it's cultural differences, whether or not it's regulatory differences, or, you know, it actually can result, right, in new opportunities, you know, for us. So let me give you um, exa uh, two examples. The first one being um, our offices in Malaysia. So um, we actually have um, um, an office right in Kuala Lumpur, okay? And we provide um, services right in the larger Klang Valley area. Um, and going into Malaysia for us, right, was actually quite um, an easy decision. It was a very clear decision for us to go there. Because I think of the similarities in culture between Malaysia and Singapore, a lot of um, the, I would say, the educational pieces that we do, quite a lot of our social media platforms and all that, is easily shared between Singapore and Malaysia. On top of that, right, um, in terms of like the platform, you know, it's just us turning on, you know, the, what Malaysia needed, which was like, you know, um, payments in, you know, Malaysian ringgit, you know, um, and for language itself, right, it's, it's mainly in English anyway. So that wasn't much of an issue. However, one of the interesting things that we found out in Malaysia was this was a fantastic opportunity there. Okay, and the opportunity was something right that was not seen in a smaller like you know city state like Singapore. In Malaysia, right, there was a lot of opportunities for stay in um, certified nurses. You know. Um, Malaysia, right, is in a very fortunate situation where there has been a lot of trained nurses out in the marketplace. And the trained nurses, right, are actually willing uh, to become stay-in nurses. Um, so we have um, instances, right, of nurses, right, who probably, you know, graduated from a really good nursing school right in Penang um, and looking for, you know, full-time work, living, right, um, in Kuala Lumpur. So this was a business opportunity presented itself to us, you know, um, that we that that we grabbed, you know, and I would say, right, this is something that is in Malaysia that is not um, prevalent in Singapore. 
in Singapore, right, most of our caregivers, I would say all, I would say 100% of our caregivers, right, are not staying. Okay. Now, the other example I was going to give you was actually the U.S. And for U.S., right, it was more, well, well I think, right, that our solutions, right, are actually very scalable because of the global phenomenon of urbanization and smaller, and smaller nuclear families. Um, but in the U.S., right, um, for us, one of the major hurdles was actually regulatory. Um, and it's really because in the U.S., right, um, I would say 99% of home health care, right, um, is actually insurable. You know? And because of this, right, um, we actually had to uh, build a platform just specific you know, to the U.S. And it's actually called PokerCare.com. But, you know, it operates in the same philosophy, but it adheres, right, to the regulatory um, um, frameworks, right, that's put up by um, the, the, the state, you know, um, the federal government, as well, right, as the, um, uh, the, the insurance associations, right, and us being able, right, to get our services insurable. So um, Book of Care is actually HIPAA uh, cleared, and HIPAA, right, it's actually um, the act, right, that looks at um, privacy of data pertaining right to how we do with patient records um, for um, for insurability purposes. So for that, right, you know, I think it's actually it was important for us, right, to have um, um, partnered with you know very strong um, local partners in the U.S. such that we will be able right to clear the regulatory frameworks and all that in order for us to have a services there. Yeah, that definitely sounds like it would be quite the obstacle to overcome and something that would have, if anybody is moving into different countries, that they would have to consider. Um, so I guess on the topic of obstacles, uh, what are some other obstacles or the largest obstacles you faced, whether it was in creation of the marketplace or as the founder and CEO of your business, um, and how did you overcome them? You know, the, the interesting thing is that we have been um, very fortunate and blessed, right, in our journey over at Caregiver Asia. I mean, yes, as with any um, startup, right, we actually would have um, a lot of feeling issues, you know, and I covered some of them just now. Like, for instance, right, we had no problems actually aggregating caregivers because there are actually a lot of caring people out there who actually want to look at caregiving as a livelihood. You know, but it was actually, um, it kind of bucked the supply and demand thing. It was actually trying to get care seekers who were comfortable enough, right, to book care online. But, you know, these to me, right, are actually obstacles, you know, because we had solutions for that, you know, and it works very well now for us because we have all these, like, you know, um, awareness pieces, you know, um, we have a lot of educational um, um content that goes out, right, to let people know it's safe and it's all right, you know, um, to book care online. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, in terms of delivering the market, um, the, the, the market model, the business model of what we do was, was actually difficult. Um, we were also very lucky in terms of funding, you know, so um, we actually recently finished our Series B, you know, and I remember that at the seat level, right, we closed within a week. <laughs> at the A level, it was within two weeks, you know. Um, and and I, I think it's really because um, the problem statement that we presented, as well as the solution that we presented, right, was very relatable to people. So I, I do think, right, that, you know, having um, a relatable business model, right, is very important when it comes to, you know, fundraising. So, um, yeah, so, so I, I would say, right, that, that so far we had a very smooth journey. Um, perhaps one of the trickier ways or the trickier things, right, that we had to handle was actually in um, setting up a team. You know, um, I, I am very lucky to have uh, very strong team members with me. But I think initially, right, um, the scaling up process, right, was a little bit, um, it was something that was, was a little bit out of my control as well. Because, right, um, when we were advertising for, you know, people to come and join us and all that, right, we actually had very little 
um, candidates, you know, who step forth. I, I think it generally could be about how, like, um, in the Singaporean context, a lot of people would prefer, you know, to work in a more stable, you know, work environment, such as working in government or MNC, myself included, you know, uh, my first job was actually in a bank. My, my second was in an MNC and the third one was in government and I stayed there for close to 15 years. You know, um, yeah, but, but I think what happens, right, is um, off within, I think like in the last 12 months, I've seen a change, you know, so a lot of the advertising that we have done out for um, scaling up because we, we did grow by, we did grow by, you know, 400%, you know, in terms of staff strength. And I would say in the last 12 months, it was much easier, you know, for us, right, to attract the right type of talent that we needed. And, um, and I think it could be because, right, that there is a lot more, um, I would say, awareness, you know, that um, joining a startup, you know, um, is something that is exciting and something, right, that is very unreaching. I mean, staffing is always a difficult, whether it's finding the right people or people that are interested or you know, that are willing to take that leap of faith on something and a completely new idea. It's always the case. Um, so second to last question is, if you could give one piece of advice to those who are listening, uh, fellow entre entrepreneurs or small business owners, um, you know, what would that be? I think a whiskey brand said it the best. You know, it's actually called, just keep walking. You know, um, I think, right, in a startup environment, both within and external, there will be a lot of changes. You know, changes, because you're, you're by nature disruptive, so changes, right, will be definitely about how governments, regulations, you know, consumers look at you. You know, disruptions within is about challenging, you know, the, your co-workers, you know, the people who believe in you um, to push boundaries. And because of this, right, you will get pushback, you know. But with pushback, right, it's about how you handle, you know, that journey. So for me, right, it's always been about just keep walking, you know. So long as you walk towards that, that, that end goal that you had set out to, to achieve, and in our case, right, it was about, you know, um, creating... Um, a delivery platform that allows, right, for transparent, affordable, and accessible care at home. I think, right, you are in a good space. You know, just keep walking towards that. You know, you would have, you know, certain paths that take you a little bit, you stray away from the path, you know, but just keep walking it, you know. And um, I think this is the best advice that I can actually give, you know, people who are starting up their company. Remain true to where you want to achieve, you know, um, the goal that you want to get to, um, and don't let anyone stop you. Yes. Um, so last question is, what keeps you inspired to just keep on walking and pushing and, you know, trying to reach the goal for Caregiver Asia or personally yourself? Actually, honestly, on a day-to-day -day basis, right, it's actually my team members, you know, in Caregiver Asia. Um, I think by nature of the fact that we are in, you know, uh, a care industry, a healthcare type of industry, um, I would say, right, that my team members, right, are a very passionate lot. You know, um, they believe in the mission. They want to make a difference, you know, to the world. And, you know, I'm looking at them replying to emails to me at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, I'm looking at them, right, um, beating their personal best, breaking through their own glass ceilings, you know, on a daily basis. And actually, I think that is the thing that keeps me motivated um, and um, wanting to break, you know, my own glass ceilings for them as well. Wonderful. Well, Wan Ling, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure having you. If any of our listeners are keen to reach out to you, um, learn more about Caregiver Asia or hear more about your story, what's the best way for them to reach you? So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about my website. <laughs> it's definitely www.caregiverasia.com. You know, or you can actually just drop me an email anytime. So my, my email is, 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 is not a difficult email. It's just like one link, W-A-N-L-I-N-G at caregiverasia.com. 
So yeah, just feel free to drop me, you know, a line if you need to talk about healthcare, if you need to, you know, get to, to get to know a little bit more about our business or even like, you know, to have a chat with me on what it is, you know, to be an entrepreneur. Thank you so much again. Well, everyone, that's it for today. Evelina from Arcadia with Wan Ling, CEO and founder of Caregiver Asia. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a great day.